Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Trinity. Welcome, church family, and those of you who are watching online. Guys, if you are a visitor here today, if you're new, please uh, check out the Visitor's Center or grab one of us and someone who looks like they've been here a while. Introduce yourself. We want to get to know you. Um, I'm Jody Guillory, our Women's Minister and Communications Director, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and I just want to give y'all a great welcome. And if you are online, please drop a comment. Let us know where you're watching from or how you're doing today. We really want to hear from you as well. So we've got a few announcements this morning. Um, giving, just a reminder that we are still giving. You can give it with the baskets in the back as you exit this morning. There's also a little drop box over here that you can give in. You can also give online and through our app. And we are so excited to announce that in a couple of weeks, we are going to be launching a new online giving platform and a new app that's all integrated we're going to be saving the church lots of money. We're going to be more efficient and hopefully able to serve you guys better. So we're excited about that. I just wanted to give you a little heads up. So be on the lookout for that information so you can get all of your giving uh, information sorted out for that. Also, prayer cards. Last week, you should have gotten um, a little card like this in your bulletin. If you're here for the, if you were not here last week, there are extra cards up front at, at the welcome desk. We're praying for our student ministry students, middle schoolers and high schoolers. So please, if you got a card, just a quick reminder to pray for them. And if you didn't, you can grab one and pray for another student as well. Also, guys, let's see. Oh, our newsletter. If you do not receive our newsletter, that's a a great way to stay connected and to, to get the news uh, for what's going on in our church and what the needs are and things like that. So if you don't receive it and you would like to, please email info at trinitybible.org. We had an important message from the elders this week uh, that you may need to check out. Also, a psalm a day. So we are journeying through the psalms together. Many of you out there I know are, are faithfully reading a psalm a day and you're following along. If you're not, you can jump in at any time. Today we're on Psalm 59, and you can join our Facebook group called TBC Community Psalms. And it's a great place where you can kind of comment, ask questions, see all of the commentary. Uh, we have lots of e staff members and even church members who are doing the commentary each day on each psalm, and it's really been a great journey. So please join us in that. Um, and with that being said, I just want to share a little bit with you this morning. Today's psalm is uh, Psalm 59. And in Psalm 59, as I was reading this morning, you know, first of all, we've come across lots of interesting uh, scriptures. And sometimes it's hard for us to reconcile the harshness of God's actions. Uh, but when we see God's character, we understand completely. And so I just want to um, share with you this morning in Psalm 59, David says, deliver me from my enemies, O God, protect me from those who rise up against me, deliver me from evildoers. And then when you skip to, and he talks about that, what those evildoers are doing. And then in verse nine, he says, O my strength, I watch for you. You, O God, are my fortress, my loving God. And so my question this morning is, what is a fortress if it doesn't keep out evil? And what is love if it doesn't protect those that it loves? And so it brought me to Psalm, and I'm, and I'm not going to take up too much of your time, but it brought me um, to Psalm 36. It brought me back to, to Psalm 36 because it was such a stark contrast between the evildoers, and, and, and David's talking about the sinfulness of the wicked, for there is no fear of God before their eyes. And it talks about their hate and their deceitfulness and their wrongdoing. And then in verse 5, it says, it talks about God's character. And it says, your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like a mighty mountains, your justice like the great deep. So I just want to encourage you this morning that, what is, what, are, what is love, what is faithfulness, and what, have, what is justice if it doesn't have the rebuke 
and the wrath that we see. And it's so hard for us to understand that. But without those things, then there is no real love and no real justice and no real faithfulness. So I want to encourage you this morning because it says that for with you is the fountain of life and in your light we see light. So let us pray this morning. Father God, we thank you so much for your love, for your faithfulness, for your righteousness and your justice. We thank you for, the, for th those of us who trust in you, you save us. And God, we, we are moved from the darkness of this world to your glorious light. And as we worship you this morning, as we worship you through our giving, through song and through your word, God, we humble ourselves and we pray that you would be with us this morning and we give you our hearts. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jody. Well, good morning, church. It's good to have you with us this morning. What a joy and a pleasure it is to come together and, uh, and to worship our God, our Savior. I'm going to ask if you would stand with me. And um, I want to remind you that we, we have a reason to worship today. We have a reason to celebrate. Um, no matter where you're at this morning, whether you're in this room or at home, man, God loves you. Christ died for you. It, no matter what you've done, no matter how bad your past is, his, his grace, his mercy abounds. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that? God is so good to us. Um, as, we, as we jump into worship, um, just continuing, uh, as Jody was reading scripture, I just want to read one more with you. It's Psalm 103. It says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Can you say amen? He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. I don't know about you, but that gr brings me great comfort knowing that once I put my trust in Jesus, he wipes away my sin. There's nothing I can do that can separate me from him. There's nothing too bad that, that is, is greater than his mercy, but no matter how great our sins are, his mercy is always more, right? Amen? Amen. Let's worship him this morning. kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the dead we could never afford cause our sins they are many his 
His mercy is more. Come on, church, let's sing it. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness through every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. sees more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more Father, thank you for your kindness and your grace and your mercy. Father, it doesn't matter where we've been or, God, even where we're at today in this journey of life. But, God, you're calling us into your presence. God, you're calling us into your arms or you're calling us into a relationship with you, Father. And the truth is, God, your mercy is greater than our greatest sin. Father, thank you. God, we give you glory and honor. God, we worship you for your forgiveness, for your mercy over our sins, for your victory, for the life that we have in you. our prayer today as David prayed, God would create a clean heart in us, a pure heart, that he would renew a right spirit in us. It's your prayer. Remove my sins, look on them no more. Wash me, I shall be whiter than the snow. Let me know joy. Let my broken bones rejoice. Make me new, oh God. Cleanse my sinful heart and renew a right spirit in me. Take me by forever by your side and let your whole 
Restore to me the joy. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. And renew a right spirit in me. Let's sing it again. Make me new. Oh, make me new, oh God. Cleanse my sinful heart. And renew a right spirit in me. Let me by forever by your side. And let your Holy Spirit dwell with me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. And renew a right spirit in me. Let me restore to me the joy of my salvation. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. And renew a right spirit in me. by his blood, only through the cross, only through Jesus. And sing this with me, for our part, it's all for him. Oh, for my part on this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this I plead, nothing but the blood Oh, Jesus, nothing, oh, nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus, nothing that we've done, oh, not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus, let's sing it out. Let's sing this as a church. We declare it. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's on the cross, his resurrection that we stand. It's our confidence. Let's sing this out together. This is all my hope and peace. Let's lift our voices. And this is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all 
my righteousness nothing but the blood of Jesus every voice every heart and oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other mount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus would you praise him for his mercy for his blood amen amen you guys could be seated thank you Kurt thank you thank you You all sounded real good on that last song. <laughs> you knew that one. You knew that one. No, thank you. <laughs> on a handful of occasions, I have had the opportunity to meet with someone who thought they were perfect. Usually, they were young and in an academic setting. My typical response is to listen, to smile, and to move on. Hmm. I struggle with sin. I have many that I could choose from, but let me give you one example. Anger, which is actually a secondary emotion, is something that... I struggle with. Some days I'm not as productive as I want, and the perfection in me drives me to anger. Sometimes I get bit by a sheep, and I'm not a farmer, and it's painful. I get angry. Sometimes I'm just hurried and busy in life, and things aren't going the way I want, I lack the control that I feel I need. And again, anger. It's like a chain reaction in my heart, and this is usually how it plays out. I go home, and I growl at my wife, which never goes well because she growls back. So I'm smarter than that. I bark at the kids. We tell them that we are happy someday to go to a counselor with them. We just will not be able to pay for it. And then in the quiet, I think perhaps I am just a victim of all of these circumstances. And it's really others' fault. I blame them. Or maybe that's just the way I am, and it's all I've ever known. The Lord made me that way. Most acknowledge that they are not perfect, but it is not our acknowledgement that matters. Instead, it is how do we rightly approach the sin in our lives. This is not easy. You see, having a relationship with Jesus is about heart change, not self-help so that it goes well with you and I, not sin management so that we just corral it in. We do not pursue a moral deism where we believe there's a God and we are supposed to be good. Instead, we follow Jesus who says, I want to change your heart. This word, to use a big theological word, is sanctification. You and I are both sinners and saints at the same time, as Martin Luther liked to call us. And we are partnering with Jesus to change our hearts, to do right, to walk wisely, to live for God, to become 
like Christ. All struggle with the little three-letter word sin. And this morning, we're going to see that sin comes with great consequence. This morning, together, I want to look at how do you and I rightly respond to the sin, whether it be anger or other things that flow up out of our heart into the world around us. We've been journeying through the book of Joshua, a very interesting book, and we're looking at faith over fear. If you think about it, one of those, faith defeats sin ultimately, while fear invites it to the dinner table. This morning, we're going to see the story of Ai and Achan and three right responses to sin, along with one key difference from where you and I sit. So if you would, turn with me to Joshua chapter 7. Uh, we're going to cover the whole chapter. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Any version will do. You can pull it up on your smartphone or your copy in God's Word. Um, I'm going to read the first part, and then we will touch on the rest as we go through. Joshua chapter 7. But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai. They returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. Only about two or 3,000 men need to go up to Ai. Do not make all the people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men from the people went up there, but they fled before the men of Ai. The men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shimbarim and struck them down on the descent. So the hearts of all the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, both he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God! Why did you ever bring the people over the Jordan only to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been willing to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say since Israel has turned their back before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and they will surround us and cut us off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? How should you and I respond when we see sin in our lives? As this story continues, we, we will see a crisis of leadership as well as one man, Achan, who took, who sins, and we see the consequences that flow from that. First response, you and I must choose obedience. Obedience. We must choose obedience so that it may go well with us. Obedience is always a choice. In verse 1, in chapter 7, we see, But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully into the regard to the things under the ban. For Achan took some of the things under the ban. Therefore the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. One man's sin adversely impacts the entire community. In the last couple weeks, it's been interesting to watch as uh, things have come out about the apologist Ravi Zacharias. And much on social media, in different directions, on his transgression, he was a man like each. He was capable. He made decisions. And even as a follower of Christ, after his death, sins that he had committed have rippled through the Christian community, undermining faith. And here in this passage, there is nothing new under the sun. One man, and this man, doesn't even appear to be a leader. He's a foot soldier. And yet, 
his sin impacts the community. In verses 2 to 5, 2 to 3,000 men should have been able to defeat Ai. They should have, but they couldn't. It's fascinating as we dwell on verses 2 to 5. Look at verse 5. Then the men of Ai struck down about 36 of Israel's men and pursued them from the gate. So the heart of all the people melted and became as water. If we sink down in 2 to 5, we never hear God speak here. And we're left to wonder, was Israel fresh off of the great victory of Jericho? Were the leadership, were the people, were they too self-confident? Not only was there sin... All right, somebody bring me another one. There we go. Thank you. Israel failed to wait. Verses 6 to 9, Joshua responds. He is despondent. 36 men had died. Hearts melted. And we see even in Joshua's response, here in his response, verse 7, Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan? Only to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. And he continues, and you can, you can hear in, jo- in, in Joshua's voice this idea that it was, it was all on him. And now there's this idea that, God, do you know what you're doing? Even leadership appears to be weak. One sin. A chain reaction. There are two paths in this life. There is our way and His way. To use the great theologians from the perspective of eternal judgment, there is either a highway to heaven, a stairway to heaven, or a highway to hell. Thank you, ACDC and Led Zeppelin. But that is in the sense of for those who either know Christ and have a personal relationship or don't know Christ, here we have God's people. And sin not only invites eternal judgment in the broad perspective, but it invites discipline, temporal discipline, immediate discipline, much like you and I with our kids. Sometimes we don't always see discipline when those in the family do things that they should not. But Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. In the Kramer household, over the last couple weeks, months, years, I've consistently told my boys, sons, Judah, Liam, Ez, guard your hearts. Specifically, we talk about the area of purity, that they need to watch at a young age what comes into their mind's eye and their ear, specifically in areas of purity and violence. There are things that they could take in now, today, that will go forward through the rest of their life and haunt them. Potential to impact marriage, potential to impact my grandkids, if I am so fortunate. Sin has a way, it perpetuates, it grows, it gets bigger. Success, is, I have said, is knowing the will of God and doing it, but the opposite, disaster, is knowing the will of God and not doing it. And that is what we see here. Well, what, what do we do? Because He's God and I'm just a man. God has provided plenty. His word speaks to us. His word and the spirit speaks to our conscience, not only the word, but the conscience. And there are times when we know the right thing to do and we must do it. Versus rebellion. No, Lord, I'm going to do it my way. 
It is not enough to know God's will. We need to do it. And often we need to check our motivations. I'm reminded of the old hymn, Come Thou Fount. It says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We want God with us. We want, I, I want him with me and you want him with you, not against us. Jesus said when he was here in his ministry, fear not the world and those that can kill the body, but fear being on the wrong side of the heavenly father who deals in the soul. What does that look like for you and I in application? How can we choose obedience? The obvious application is you and I need to be close and into this book. We need to know God's will in order to do it, but this is not an end to itself. It never has been. The goal is Jesus. It is that we walk with him that we do the right thing. Right things are often hard things. I was thinking in my own life, and two came immediately to mind. One in the past, when I was 23, I had been dating Catherine, and the Lord did not give me a piece to marry her. I still am and was crazy about her. And I remember thinking, if I do this, this will hurt her so bad. And yet, the Lord will take care. And I knew that. I knew I had to do the right thing. I broke up with her. It was worse than I thought. <laughs> the Lord took care of all that. She's sitting here today. But that's in the past. What about the present? Because that past life seasons are easy to reflect on. I've been reading a book called not about not being hurried. I'm only two or three chapters in, and through course of circumstances and events, yesterday I looked at my kids around the dinner table, and I said, guys, I have been on this phone too much. Whether it be work or social media, and daddy wants to learn to live in the present. Do you know how hard it was for me to put my phone in the drawer next to my desk? You would have thought that it had attached itself to me. And yet, I found myself being called by Jesus to do the right thing in the moment. Hard things. My friends, that is our faith. That is when we can touch it and feel it. And we know that we are walking with him. We must choose obedience. How do you and I, how do we respond to sin? Well, choose obedience. Second, if patterns of sin are present, if they are buried deep in our lives, we need to seek to change our ways. We need to seek help. Versus playing God with games with God and deceiving him. No, I'm, I'm fine. I can, I can take this bit of sin that's been here for decades and I can just bury it. And it will have no consequences. Verses 10 to 15 in this passage. Look at verse 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, rise up. Why is it that you have fallen on your face? Israel has sinned and they have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And they have taken some of the things under the ban and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become a curse. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Verse 13, Joshua, rise up, do something. Verse 10, rise up, why? God knows what's going on, there's a problem here. We don't deceive him. 13, rise up, and he calls Joshua to consecrate the people. Verse 14, 
Joshua gets up first thing early the next morning. There had been a leadership paralysis. The leadership had been sitting on their thumbs. It's fascinating. I'm reading right now through Exodus and Numbers. And in twice, both in Exodus and Numbers, it says to the leadership, if people sin, go find out what it is and give a sacrifice and move on. And here Joshua just has a come apart. So we see not only failure of an individual, but we see failure of leadership here as well. Verse 15, God says, remove the problem. It is disgraceful. Achan is a very unique Old Testament story. Matter of fact, there's probably only one other story like it in the Bible, and that is the story in the New Testament of Ananias and Sapphira when they seek to deceive specifically the Lord and his people. With Ananias and Sapphira, here we see judgment within the nation Israel. Ananias and Sapphira, a parallel in the book of Acts, we see judgment within the New Testament church. Not judgment specifically, tr- discipline. They are disciplined. We, we think about church discipline. Sometimes we talk about that. Church discipline always points to truth. And typically, it sheds light on deception that everybody is aware and nobody is moving against. The goal of our life is not behavior modification. We have to be careful here. We say, oh, I I won't get as angry. Oh, I I won't say these words. Oh, it's not behavior modification. It is heart change that we are looking for. We want God with us, verses in verse 12, this idea of him opposed to us. We want to walk with Jesus, not be away in any sense. God is holy. He is in the Old Testament, and he's the same God in the New Testament. Jesus is holy. He is set apart. He is other. He is consecrated. He is different. And God's word is not to be mocked. As I'm now about 120 days here, I'm starting to get people asking me to marry them. Hallelujah. Marriage is awesome. But one of the things when it comes to any couple, whether this is the first time or a a second or third time with marriage, there are two things that the New Testament calls marriages to. Specifically before marriage, one is that We are equally yoked spiritually with our spouse. How can two become one if they are not on the same page spiritually? And second, sex is for marriage, not the runway to marriage. And I don't get paid enough for this, but I do it anyway. If anyone comes to me and says, Michael, will you marry us? I look at them and I say, absolutely, but we're going to cover some ground first. And one is... I've got to make sure you're on the same page spiritually. And two, we're going to honor God when it comes to sex. Now, why would I do that? My friends, we are to look different than the world. And God has his purposes. And they are good and they are protection. He's not picking on us. They are boundaries for a good protection because he is a loving father. As followers of Christ, we should be coming more like him. And no one, I am not perfect. Neither are we. And it's not perfection on this side of eternity that we are striving for because you will, you and I will not reach it. But it is pursuing sanctification. It is joining Jesus on a heart change. It is putting to death the flesh. We must battle, fight, give no quarter to sin in our lives. The cost is too great. Sun Tzu in his book, The Art of War, says, If you know the enemy and you know yourself, 
You need not fear the result of a hundred battles. Then he says, if you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. And if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Let's look at the enemy. Sin. Sin is a cancer. But beyond that, it is more like type 2 diabetes. We've got it. And there's a question of what are we going to do on this side of eternity. Sin is four things. They're quite simple, but they're very true. Sin is stupid. Meet someone trapped in sin, and they are the dumbest person you will meet that day. It has a stupefying effect. You give it an inch, and it will take a mile. As I was thinking about this, I remember showing up at an older gentleman's house, and um, I bought him tater tots from Hardee's. We ate tater tots outside as we talked. He had lost his, his wife, and he was grieving. And I went just to, to spend time with him. I didn't really know the guy, but he attended our church. And while we were there, a, a lady about his age pulled up and started to, she was just in his house. And I was like, who's that? He goes, oh, you didn't know. That's my first wife. I said, great. And I just looked at him. He said, well, she comes over every week now that my second wife died and cleaned the house. I said, what? <laughs> and he just, as a matter of fact, he said, well, you probably didn't know I was married once before. I said, no, whatever. And he said this, my wife didn't want to have sex. I had two daughters, and she was overwhelmed, so I went and found some. And there I sat, looking at a man eating tater tots, thinking, you walked out on your wife for that reason. He had two daughters that were in their teen years. His first wife was still cleaning his house prone to wander. Not only does sin have a, a stupefying effect, sin creates sorrow. It's not just our problem. It wrecks. It wrecks lives and relationships around us. I'll continue with this guy. He continued to tell his story. I said, well, do you have kids? He said, yeah, I have two daughters. He goes, they never come and see me. I said, how old were they when you went out, stepped out on your wife. They were like 8 and 12. They were now full grown. Not only does sin create sorrow, but sin scars, and it hinders forward motivation. Specifically with Jesus, this guy had attended church his entire life, and I'm not sure he'd ever moved past the point when he stepped out on his wife because there was no remorse she was at fault. It wasn't him. He had no part to play. He was a hard old man. As a matter of fact, he's the only guy I've ever had in the parking lot. I asked him how he was doing, and he cussed at me and then walked in and went to church. <laughs> Got to have a lot going on to cuss at the pastor on Sunday morning. Not only is sin stupid, not only does it create sorrow, not only does it scar but sin sows the whirlwind. We put too cheap a price on the price tag of sin. We say, oh, that doesn't matter. Oh, that, that can live in my heart till I go home. This man came to mind not because of the first three stories, but because of this. In the weeks later after he was grieving and he was alone because his daughters wouldn't come in to see him. I remember going and meeting with him in the hospital. It wasn't even a hospital, it was a nursing home. He wouldn't talk to the nurses. Then he stopped eating. Then he just shut down. And two days before he died, I remember going and seeing him and thinking, this is the most miserable man I have ever met. He is alone, he is left to himself, and he has chosen his path. 
Whether he knew the Lord or not, I do not know. The enemy is sin. We are to give it no quarter in our lives, and it is present in each of us because we are not Mary Poppins. We are not practically perfect in every way. That's a lie. In our marriages, we are not practically perfect. As parents, we are not. As grandparents, as friends, as leaders, as... No. Leave that to Mary Poppins. God, at the same time, doesn't promise that this life will be easy. There are many stressors and strains that come that will make us want to act out. He's still reigning. And the antidote is three things. First, it is to be in God's Word and around His people. They have an effect. Second, is it's not just here, it's to walk with Jesus. And third, and we rarely talk about this, our hope is not on this side of eternity. It is in the next life to come. Let me talk briefly about each of these first. As we spend time in God's Word, the habit of just being in His Word and being around His people... It reminds us of what we already know about God and His will. It refines us over time, and it takes off rough edges. It sheds light, and it illuminates the unknown that we just have never seen or realized. My mentor, who is now with the Lord, used to say, the Word will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Word. And yet... We can, there's a danger here and we must speak to it. This is not it. We go here so that we find Jesus. And it is Jesus that affects heart change. He is the surgeon and he is so tender. I like the refrain, though our sins are so many, his mercy is more. It is greater and it abounds. Think of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. He meets Jesus, and what happens? The woman caught in adultery, she meets Jesus, and what happens? And then I think of the dear lady in the last season. Every Sunday, she would give me a kiss on the cheek. None of you are to do that. She was special. Every Sunday, she would find me, and she would come, older lady, and she would just get me, tell me how much she loved me. And as I got to know this sweet saint, I found out that she had had five husbands. Five. And then I got to do the premarital counseling with her and her six, and she knew Jesus. And I have never, when I thought of joy, having run into Jesus, this was the lady that came to mind. She had an amazing voice. It was And she would often come up and just sing solos, a cappella. And the two things she would sing about were Jesus and the hope for the next life. This woman understood where you and I find peace in the midst of a hard and troubled and hard-hearted world. That leads to the third. Not only is it the Word and His people, not is it a pursuit of Jesus, but it is a future hope. When you and I will stand before Jesus, for those who have a personal relationship with Him, we will stand before Jesus. And in a moment, He's going to look me in the eye. And all I'm going to want to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry I was angry here and here And I wish I'd been more mature here. And in an instant, he's going to look at me and he's going to say, that's been taken care of. I want to say I'm sorry. And he'll say, son, you are forgiven. And for the first time, I will be free. That is our hope. What do we do? What can we practically do to move away first? Pray, my friends, where there are things that have been with you for years. It is a process. But take that to the Lord. No deception. Lord, here it is. 
In some cases, it is seeking help, a friend, a counselor. And when we know that we struggle, we stay away from those places. It's like a mousetrap. I have a mousetrap up here. I don't know if you can see it. It's loaded. Makes my fingers tingle. Two weeks ago, we found out that we had a mouse running around. We decided he was going to be a pet for a while until he started eating our food. Then it was game on. Last weekend, I didn't set one trap. This was a pretty bold mouse. He chewed up my toothbrush. Oh, no. Yeah, that's kind of gross. I got a new one. It's all right. <laughs> no. So he chewed up my toothbrush, and I looked at Miss Debbie, and I said, this mouse has gone a bridge too far. I brought in two of the old school trusty traps, giant hunk of cheese on both. You know what that guy did? He emptied my first trap. That was a full meal. That was about half a mouse right there. You know what happened on the second trap? I got him. (laughs) Friends, sin is like that trap. It doesn't care about you. It's not your buddy. It'll get you. It'll get you. What do we do? Always stand in His grace. You and I, as followers of Christ, we can stand in the grace of Jesus. And at the same time, we can hate sin in our lives. Never hate the sinner. Jesus loved the sinner like you and I. But the sin, sin is not your friend. It is not a pet to let run around our lives. Here in verse 16, to the end of the chapter, we see God's discipline. Verse 16 to 26, Joshua and Israel take action. And for the sake of time, I'll just walk through it. 16 to 21, Joshua takes lots. He's going to find out what's going on. He's now back into God's plan. Leaders begin to lead in verse 22. Listen to the action verbs. They sent, they ran, they took, they brought, they poured out what had been taken. They took Achan, they brought him. A lot of good stuff real quick. Taking care of things. Verse 25, it says... Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones. And they buried them with, burned them with fire. They had stoned them with stones. They raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day. And Yahweh turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor, or trouble, to this day. Joshua holds Achan accountable, but really it's not Joshua, it's God. Achan had buried, he had deceived, and he was buried in judgment. There was trouble. It's fascinating in this passage, Achan literally says, I have sinned. There are only seven characters in the Bible that say, I have sinned in this way. The first was Pharaoh. Before he stood against the Lord, the second was Balaam the prophet. The third was King Saul. Catch this, the fourth was King David. Shimei, Judas Iscariot, and catch this one, the prodigal son. I like that. I like that. Achan, we tend to say, That's not fair. Why this judgment? He just took a little. I mean, stone, fire, his family, his animals. But let's back up before we blame God. His family would have been complicit. They would have known. In Deuteronomy 24, it says that sons will not be killed for the sins of their father. 
If that was not enough, in verse 20 and 21, when, when Achan says that I have sinned, what he is basically doing is he is exonerating the people in God and saying, that's all on me. And last, it wasn't that he took something little. He took 200 silver coins, a 12 and a half pound gold bar, and a royal robe that would have made entirely of gold. Basically, when this guy ran into to what he should have been doing, he basically stopped on the attack and would have had to have been extremely deceptive to not be seen by anyone to bring it back and bury it in his tent. Sin invites death and judgment in our lives and discipline. And often we cry, not fair, but we don't want fair. We want mercy. We want mercy. Sin always brings trouble. We are to run from sin. Yet a relationship with Jesus, from a relationship with Him, flows grace and mercy. And yes, discipline, because that too is love. And we tend to not like genocide, and we don't like judgment, And we don't like to look at ourselves and say, I am the sinner. And yet we lose sight that God is doing just fine running the universe. I like how the old theologian J. Vernon McGee says, if we don't like how God is running the universe, we can go create and run our own universe. Yet, isn't that exactly what people do? I don't have a problem I don't need a savior. That is death. You and I must choose life. Sin always invites death. We must run from sin to the cover of grace. You and I are to live for Jesus versus sin and passing pleasure. We must be killing sin or it will be killing us. I like the picture of an umbrella. I'm not Mary Poppins, but here I stand under God's will, in His grace. And my friends, if it is raining and I want to walk like this, that's on me. God is so gracious to us. He is so gracious and kind. Choose the umbrella, not a mousetrap. Achan nibbled. There was judgment. Is Achan in heaven? I have no clue. Scripture is silent, but this I do know. I have been bought by Jesus' blood. The beauty of heaven has been wrapped in my shame. My chains are gone. My debt has been paid. I have been moved from death to life. And I live from grace to grace. Jesus changes everything. He has come that may we may have life and have it full both in this life and in the eternal. He defeated sin and death and you and I have a new master and we are free to live for him. And yet it is our choice to focus on him and stand in his will and his grace to love Jesus and to hate sin. That is grace for today. How do you and I approach sin in our lives? Because it is there we are marbled with it. First, we must choose obedience. Not behavior modification, but heart change. We must be willing to change our ways, and often that begins with prayer, but it is proactive. That does not happen passively. And we always, always find ourselves standing in the grace of Jesus. Hate sin. 
love Jesus. That is the sanctification. It is a process. It is a journey. And what about my anger? The journey of my anger when I was in my 20s, I never got mad at anybody. If you were an idiot, you were an idiot, and I wouldn't get angry at you. And then I got married to this beautiful woman, and I thought it was her problem. About the time I thought I'd turn the corner, I had one kid, then two kids, then three kids, then four kids. Then I decided to get a dog. (laughs) And you know, the journey is long. A month or two ago, I'd go home after a long day and couldn't growl at the wife and couldn't snip at the kids. But darn it, if my dog had dug in the flowers, I was wailing on him. Whose problem is that? Yet he's not done with me. And I don't want him to be. I want my heart to reflect Jesus. And there is great news. His grace isn't going to give up on me. Hopefully I age and become more mellow. But what I really want is I want him to change my heart. And there will come a day when I stand face to face with him. And my anger will be laid down at his feet. That will be the day. And until then, I will love Jesus and I will hate sin. Let's pray. Father, that's not easy sledding. And Lord, as your word speaks, we all stand. You read our hearts. There is nothing that is hid from you. And yet, while we are made in your image, we are but dust. And Lord, that is why grace looks so good. Lord, may we come to understand more and more who you are and who we are, and may Jesus increase. Lord, I thank you that you love me, that you love these. May we continue to pursue you well. It's in the great name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand our feet. What love could remember no wrongs we have done. I'm dishing on knowing he counts not this sum thrown into a sea. Without bottom or shore Our sins, they are many His mercy is more What patience would wait As we constantly roam what father so tender is welcoming home he welcomes the weakest the valleys the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise him praise the lord his mercy They are many, His mercy is more. It's all about His kindness.
kindness. What the riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Cause our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Every voice, praise the Lord. Sees more stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more stronger than darkness. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Thanks, Kurt. Kurt, on um, channel 10, I think our weather guy, Keith, I heard that some guy named Kerf, <laughs> did he have a birthday this weekend? Yeah? 37, I hear? 25. 25. <laughs> Kerf would like a hug, so if you see him out here, give him a hug. A blessing. A blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you in the midst of our sin. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace that can only come from him. Go in his peace.